Hi folks, Ben here from Red Valley Outdoors. Again, we're just into April. Um, as you can see, damp again, that's normal. Uh, I've just got a camp set up. I'm sure you've just seen me make a hash out of most of that, but uh, it's up and it'll do. And I just wanted to do something different today. Uh, I'm not gonna do any cooking. I wanted to talk to you guys about some of the kit that I use when I'm going out doing this type of stuff. Not necessarily when I'm doing the big camp cooks, like for me and my friends, um, or, you know group overnighters and stuff like that but more the kit that I started building when I first started going out on my own just into the woods a couple of nights here and there you know uh, a, a solo overnight kit and um, talk to you about some of the equipment I use and some of the things I've made so uh, let's go and have a look so this is the bag that I use uh, it's by a company called Outdoor Gear now I didn't actually buy this bag I got given it by a friend of mine and I don't know anything about it or the company other than the fact that I really like it it's got everything I need side pockets front pocket this uh, sort of elastic uh, webbing stuff at the front it just has loads of different attachment points all over it pockets all over it it's a really multi-functional bag uh, I don't know whether it was expensive I don't know at all I don't know anything about it it has the two straps, loads of adjustment toggles here at the back as you can see. It has a lower lumbar guard and a fairly padded, it's not the most padded, but a fairly padded waist support around here. And I love these, they you know they really do help when you're carrying heavy loads like I often do because I'm taking out loads of cooking equipment and that's part of what I enjoy. So um, you know I, I, I do value that quite a lot. So but back to the front here. You can see I've got my uh, I've got my deer hunter jacket just slung on the bottom here with these uh, with these loops. Now, if I'm taking loads more equipment or ingredients or stuff like that, I can actually use these to sling the sleeping bag on the bottom, and that's really helpful because it opens up a, a great big you know area of room in there in the bag that I can fit more ingredients and more precious things in and whatnot. Now, it's also got this compartment at the bottom. If you can see, well, I just try and stand it up a bit. This zips open, and it's got like a separate contained dry area for clothes and things that I presume you don't want to get wet. And it's handy. It's handy. I don't necessarily use it all the time to uh, its full potential, but actually, when I when I go out and do the cooks that you've seen me do previously, my frying pan actually fits in there, and then the handle shoots up underneath this webbing, and I can pull that tight. And that's perfect, it's on the outside, it's at the bottom, it's not digging into my back. It's great for that, love it. Now, it's also got, like I mentioned, these uh, front pocket, which has got, if I can get that open, look. Which has got a small inner pocket in there, and I keep all sorts of bits and bobs in there. I'll go through all that stuff in a moment. But other things I like about it, are that the side pockets are not stitched across the top and the bottom so that I can fit things like this uh, or an axe or whatever I need down the side there and they stay and you've also got this uh, strapping this webbing across here I can't remember what they call it but it's basically you can cinch the bag up with it and make it tighter uh, and that acts really well to keep your tools in place things I don't like about this bag is it has two big reflective strips uh, on these buckles at the front, but they're easily replaced and at some point I may or may not get round to replacing them depending on how much they irritate me. But anyway, on to the contents. Okay, so inside the main compartment it's uh, pretty obvious what you need in there. Fire kit and sleep system. So to start with, if I open that there's this extra little ratcheting strap across here, drawstring, and straight out is my fire kit. Now obviously the very first thing was the tarpaulin that I put up, uh, get the shelter, get dry. That was the first thing that was packed in there. But second, I've got my sleep system underneath, some cooking equipment and this little fire kit. Now this is a bit like one of those drawers that you have at home, uh, that you know those drawers that you just throw everything into and the miscellaneous stuff that you, you're pretty sure you need at some point but you never really use. But my fire kit's a bit like that, and uh, I'll show you what's in there. So in here I've got my uh, headlamp, 
which isn't one of the Petzl really nice military ones, but it's, it's great, it's Energizer. It was pretty cheap, it does the job. I keep that in there because often, you know, that's when I'm using my headlamp, is when I'm getting my fires going, or uh, it's just in the top of the bag, nice and accessible, so I keep that in there. Length of paracord, always. And every time I go out, I try and pick some birch bark if I can, and then I'll try and scrape all the really damp stuff off the back. You know, when you're peeling the birch bark off, even this one's quite thick and hard, but um, I'll try and get remove most of that and keep this and dry that out at home. It's invaluable, this stuff, you know? If it's damp conditions and you're trying to start a fire, this stuff can really help you out. It's permeated with the resin and it burns really, really well, even in the damp. Got a Zippo lighter. A normal lighter. And as you can see, everything's covered in dust because I've got various cramp balls and bits of punk wood and all sorts of stuff in there, but that's fine, it all still works. And this is my Light My Fire um, fire steel. This is my spare one. I don't use this one too often these days, although it was what I started with. And it still does work, it's fantastic. You know, it does the job. That lives in there. More cord. I keep a candle. These are really handy, you know, late at night, a little bit of light. Or if you just want to keep a permanent flame going whilst you're messing about trying to get a fire started, they can be incredibly handy. And like I said earlier, cramp ball. I pick these up as and when I spot them around the woods, dry them out at home. Dardilia concentrica, um, due to the concentric circles in there. Incredibly light, incredibly handy. Throw a spark into that, it takes almost instantly first time every time actually uh, and then you can break that piece off so as not to use the whole cramp ball and then put it into a, a nest and blow that into flame and that has worked in the past for me and is really handy uh, and like I said earlier just like pieces of very very dry sort of punky wood that's all broken apart so no particular order nothing's all segregated off I think I've got some spare batteries in there uh, and that's about it that's that's my, my little fire bag full of flammables and bits that I use to get a fire going. I keep my main fire steel that I use majority of the time elsewhere. I normally wear that on my belt, actually, as you may or may not have seen in one of my previous videos, and I'll show you that a bit later. So that all just goes back in there. Nice and organized. Yeah, right. Next up is the infamous Zebra Billy. Everybody knows about these things. As you can see, mine's pretty well used. In fact, it's uh, got a little split on there where I'm sure one of my kids jumped on it at some point. But um, it still works. It's great, you know. These things, fantastic. Got the little separate lid there. Now, what is slightly different about mine is that inside it, just tucked down there, as you can see, I keep uh, my little wood-burning stove. And I love this little system, it works fantastically. So, comes in this nice little bag. Again, I, I don't know who makes this, I can't remember, I've had it quite a while. And it comes out into its various pieces. Uh, I never, I've never really used this, this is for putting the gel, uh, liquid gels and so on and so forth in. I've, I've never really used that, but I keep it anyway, just to keep it together. That goes on the bottom, that slides in. That goes on top, and the Zebra Billy fits on top perfectly. And when I'm going out, I'll use that all the time. You, you don't need much more than that. You know, if you're doing a big pot of something, rehydratable food or chilli or something like that, you've got that on top, and you can also put the smaller one on, do drinks and things in it, or uh, even use it as a small frying pan, which I have done in the past. And what I like about that is it all just goes in there. And I just think that's a really nice little system. I do like the fire box that a friend of mine uses. I think that's great, um, but I don't have one. And so I kept to this. And it was just something nice about the way that it all fits together for me. Uh, when he can do it, that all goes in there. And that goes in the top. Put that in there. That in there. All fits back in this bag. And uh, it was more by uh, accident, really, that I managed to judge this. 
Um, I had a sneaking suspicion if I got this size of uh, Billy, which I can't remember what that is. I can't remember if it's 12 or 16. But anyway, but that just literally drops in there, an absolute treat. And then the lid goes on, and often I'll keep sponges and bits of cleaning equipment in there, and that lives in my bag. All right, so this is the sleep system that I use, especially in the cold weather. Um, so I've just got this cheap bivy bag on the outside, and it was cheap. I, I can't even—I don't know who makes this. It was about 25 quid. I don't actually know how good it is, but it does tend to stop some of the water. Uh, and I use that, especially when I'm using a camp setup like I have today. As you can see, there is some water and currents coming in. But only a bit, I mean, you know, it just stops the splashes and stops your bag getting completely, uh, well, just damp and then soaking through and cooling in the early hours of the morning, which is not what you want. Um, now I've got this sleeping bag inside. This is by a company called Trim. And it's got a minus two comfort rating on it and a minus eight limit. Well, I don't know how good that is because I've spent some very cold nights in this thing before. Uh, in its defence, that was in a hammock without an under blanket, so you know perhaps that's my own fault for not ground camping on a uh, chilly night. But um, generally, when I'm on the floor in this setup, it's very good. Totally warm, no problem. All the way through the winter, that does me absolutely fine. Uh, and lastly, underneath that, I have the inflatable Van Gogh Trek 3 standard, as you can see there. And I like this little setup all kept inside by the bivvy bag so that goes inside the bivvy bag that on top of it and the bag you can toggle that up a bit and it just helps to keep everything still and stable and it means you're not sliding off of the uh, the, the, the ground mat during the night you're not rolling off of it and any splashes that do come in from the water obviously are reflected or deflected should I say by the uh, by the bivvy bag so that's my little sleep system, and I like using that, it, it does me very well. It's much warmer, I found, than the hammock camping, which is what I started doing. Uh, I save that now for the summer months. Okay, so this is just an overview of some of the normal kit I carry. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about it as I'm sure you're used to seeing this type of stuff. You know, this is what everybody's carrying. Um, these are some just hard wearing leather, very very sturdy gloves there made by a company called uh, Dirty Rigger. Um, to show you that there. And they're really well made, they're really tough. The only downside is they uh, are workman's gloves um, and they don't have any ends of the two front fit the two first fingers uh, and that's for you know people using machines so that they still have some dexterity left there but it's no good if you go and slice across the end of your thumb uh, or finger even but generally they work pretty well the infamous Baco Laplander needs no introduction I'm sure um, I recently upgraded to this little beauty you can see here this is Wilkinson sword and um, I can just pull that out there haven't even used it yet, it came yesterday. So I'm looking forward to trying that out. I'm sure that's gonna be helpful. Now this is a funny little beast. This is my Baco Axe. Um, it's made by Baco. And when I bought it, it was really cheap. It was, you know, it was 25 quid or something. As you can see, it's got loads of this orange paint still on there, but the whole head was pretty much orange. All, all of that was orange, as you can still see in the lettering. And also right the way down to about here somewhere on the handle, and then again at the end, this was all painted orange as well. Uh, I didn't like that. And, and it also came with absolutely no edge on it whatsoever. None at all. Blunt as you like, which I was quite surprised about. It didn't come with a sheath, but you know, it was 20 quid. It was very, very cheap. So I've sanded. Oh, and it also had um, in the end here this. Uh, wedge that obviously opens up the wood and keeps the head on was actually part of the formed part of the hanger that they would hang it on the shelf with uh, on on the little hangy display thing like that so I've done a bit of work to it just sanded it all off got as much of the paint off as I can filed that down 
and took it to a sanding, a grinding disc and put much, much more of an edge on it. That's very, very sharp now. Uh, and and it, now it does the job perfectly well. And like I say, it was about, I don't know, 23 quid, something like that, nothing much. Um, first aid kit, anybody that doesn't carry one of the four. This is a little one by Euro Hike. Uh, it's actually one of two that I carry, the other one's in the bag. I won't bother getting that out and showing you. If you don't know anything about first aid or how to use this, you really should. This little light um, is great. I don't even know who makes it. V-Life it says there, look. Um, it's rechargeable. It's very, very bright. It's very, very powerful. I think it's like 350 lumens. The battery life's good. It's got this... Uh, glass breaking, hardened glass breaking tip, it's supposed to be a survival thing, it's, it's well made, it's metal, um, you know, it has the uh, sort of focusing beam as you can see there on that and, and that works really well, in conjunction with my headlight that's most of what I need. Now onto this bit, my knives, when I first started out I had the uh, Mora Companion, fantastic little knife. I'm sure many, many people know and love and use it, and I, I still do. I've just lent mine to a friend recently. When I wanted to upgrade, I didn't have any money, actually. Uh, I just didn't have the money to go out and buy really nice bushcrafting knives, you know. Um, there are some fantastic ones being made out there, but I didn't have that. So I decided to try and make one. And this was my first attempt, this one right here. Um, it's made from 01 tooling steel which I bought in 6mm thick, it is very very thick across the back there and I bought that along with uh, a single lump of curly birch and some brass pins and bits and bobs and I watched a few tutorials and I knew a bit about metal working anyway, it kind of runs in my family, my family have been doing that stuff for a long time and I spent a long time working with my dad who was a very skilled sheet metal worker and you know heating and bending and welding metal so it didn't come completely unnaturally to me um, and so I just gave it a go really I used some fairly rudimentary tools I didn't have the amazing knife grinding machine the, th the sort of three wheel knife grinders that I see most guys using or certainly professional guys using but nonetheless it came out fine it's got a 23 degree Scandinavian grind on it it's still absolutely sharp. You can see I've beaten it up. I really have given it a hammering. And it's about four years old now, I suppose. Um, I put the lanyard hole in there. I don't really like having lanyards on there, to be honest. But, um, you know, nonetheless, I put it in there. Um, I put some red fibre liner card down the side to help with the bonding. I don't know how much that's necessary these days. Um, the epoxies are so good, I really don't think they contribute that much, but I liked the idea of them. As you can see, I contoured it, put some palm swells in there, and I tried to make it my own, my own design a bit, I suppose, as well. Um, and, and it is my own design, I did do it all by hand myself, um, and I'd sketched it out from a piece of paper in the first place. So, that was my first attempt at knife making. And still, this is my this is my bushcraft knife. That is what I use. This is the one I take out and I beat up and you know do do my work with. You saw me using it earlier, probably. Um, but after a while, I wanted to make another one and just see if I could make something a bit prettier. Um, employ some other skills, some skills that I'd seen people doing, and see if I could make something a bit nicer. So then I tried again and I made this one. And this one's quite different. I. It's, it's not a typical bushcrafting knife. It's more like the American drop point hunters, I suppose. And again, I designed it myself. I sketched it out on some paper and then got my steel. These are stock removal knives. So I start off with a piece of 01 tooling steel and then sketch it out and, and then begin shaping and forming it. Now, this one did come out quite nice, I think, although there are you know, some mistakes around the place. Absolutely, definite mistakes. Uh, still lessons to be learned. But, overall, I was quite pleased with it. And I haven't really beaten it up that much. Now, again, this is 01 tooling steel blade, except this time I put a flat grind on it from the top to the bottom with a, with a micro bevel along the bottom there. Uh, a small choil this time, 
which I, I didn't do on the previous knife. And I chose to put some stainless steel bolsters on this one. And that was significantly harder. That was a skill that I wanted to try. I wanted to try my hand and see how I would do and I would fare. And let me tell you, it's hard. It's really hard, especially when you don't have all the right tools. But nonetheless, lessons to be learned. So if I bring this out into the light a little bit, you might be able to see that along this bolster, you can't really see the pins at all where I joined them. But on, on this side, if I catch it in the light, you can just about see them there. And that's because I made a mistake. I didn't peen them over properly. And the surface I was using to strike upon and, and hit the ends of the pins to try and peen them over wasn't hard enough. I didn't have a proper anvil. And also you can see through there where this the, these two pieces of stainless have not completely closed up around the steel there and sort of formed a nice tight bond. There is there are some gaps around there. So like I said, mistakes, lessons to be learned. I did some file work across the back of the blade and I put a swedge on it down the top edge there, down the spine towards the tip. I also tapered the tang from about six millimeters, which is what the steel was, it was left over from making the previous knife, down to about two and a half down there. Um, this is Iroko wood, there's very, very water resistant rainforest wood that I, I actually had from work. Um, and again, these are 316 stainless pins. I've not bothered to put a lanyard hole in this one, and I've not done much in the way of sort of palm swelling or anything. In fact, I wanted to keep this one simple and elegant. I've just shaped the handle there. It fits my hand very well. And overall, this is a very sturdy knife. I'm sure it will last many, many years. Some, some lessons definitely to be learned. I'm, I'm no master knife maker, but these are my two knives. These are all I use now. I don't have anything else. I've given my moral companion away, um, and, they, and they do me very, very well. And for the price of the materials, I think to make both of these knives was the O1 tooling steel was about 50 pounds. Uh, no, sorry, it was about 30 odd pounds. Uh, and then the, the pieces of wood, I, I bought that. I can't remember how much that was. I, I found this uh, with bits and pins. I don't know, maybe maybe a, a complete total of something like 60, 60 quid I've spent on you know the materials to make both of those knives. Now, I didn't make this sheath. I ordered this off Amazon. Uh, I've been gradually and slowly collecting the materials necessary for leather working and sheath making. There's quite a lot of them. Various pins and, uh, you know, stitch groovers and balms and oils and all sorts of stuff that you need. And I'm gathering it together. Uh, but I wanted to get out and use this. And I didn't want that to hold me back because it's taken me ages to get a sheath ready. So I just bought that off Amazon. And that was dirt cheap. It was real leather. Um, it's pretty sturdily made. It's not the best. I'm sure there's loads better. But actually it does fantastically. It fits my knife. It secures it really well. I don't have to worry about it falling out. It doesn't fall out. Um, and it works perfectly. And it's about, I don't know, 15 quid. If that. It virtually nothing. Anyway, this is my fire steel that I mentioned earlier, my main one that I use. Uh, this is a beast. This is great. You, you can't go wrong with that. I'm, I made the paracord tie for that myself. And that just tucks down the edge of this little pouch that I keep my um, Openel in. And when I'm generally making fires, I'll use the back of the Openel to scratch along the blade and produce my sparks there and so they both live in my belt normally when I'm using them in this little pouch they snuggle down next to one another and they remain tight and I can always pull this out really easily because of the paracord tie there and that's the bulk of my equipment that I carry around and use um, I don't even have a sheath for this you'll love this this is super professional look this is a jiffy bag basically that's very tattered, as you can see, and I just slide that in there, and that lives in my. So that's my kit. That's my setup. Uh, thanks for joining me today, um, and I hope you enjoy some of this. And I, I've actually been asked to go. A friend of mine has asked me to make him one of these. He really liked it. It's a, a guy that I go shooting with, and 
So I'm going to be. I've ordered the steel and I'm going to be making one of these. And if you're interested, I think I'm going to do it step by step. Follow through. I won't explain everything that I do, but I'm sure you'll be able to see the, the, the way that I made these. So if you are interested in making your own knives, like I said, I'm no master craftsman. I'm no, uh, you know, LB custom knives or Jack Law or anything like that. Those guys are phenomenal at what they do. But these work, they're rugged, they won't break, they're not going anywhere, they're sharp. The, the edge retention, I've done all the heating and the tempering and they hold their edge fantastically. This is years old and I just strop this every now and then and it's still razor, completely razor, um, bulletproof stuff. So, you know, I'm going to make another one and if you want to see and you want to catch up and follow along, then you can. Alright folks, well thanks for sticking around listening to me waffle on about some of the kit that I use. Um, I had some plans this weekend and they fell through but I hadn't prepared a, a meal or a big cook or anything that I would normally do. Uh, I should be going out fairly soon, uh, maybe with Luke, maybe for an overnighter, maybe with some other friends of ours. Uh, definitely going to be doing some more cooking then. I just wanted to show you guys some of the kit that I use and just talk to you because I had a few hours spare basically. I'm going to put all the descriptions uh, in the link down below to as much of the gear as I can. Uh, obviously all the bits that I made myself, you won't be able to find those, but all, most of the rest of it was easily available and cheap. I haven't got a big budget for this stuff, you know, I can't justify loads and loads of money on expensive gear, so most of this stuff is cheap. Anyway, like I say, all the descriptions, uh, in the description, all the links will be down there, I'll put as many in as I can. And thanks for just sticking around, listening to me waffle. If you're interested in this type of stuff and seeing some more, uh, subscribe, hit the notification. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, goodbye from me at Red Valley Outdoors. Take care.